Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for showing up for our first hybrid meeting since this whole pandemic thing. Um, I hope we get more people in today, but if not, uh, it's at least a good test. Mm -hmm. I like that we have, well, we've already lost like, five people. <laughs> um, today we have a uh, Tony Sabat, I hope that I pronounced that right, and Stephen Waltz. Um, they wanted to talk about uh, some civil dirty stuff and they wanted to talk about their new book that they're putting out. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Tony. Okay, awesome. Can you all see my, we just uh, just want to make sure everybody can see and hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Good. Well, thank you everybody so much for the time. Really appreciate it today. Um, we're excited to be here. And um, this is uh, kind of like the first stop of our book tour, um, you know, as we're, as we're going around and, you know, over the internet. But um, uh, let's give a quick introduction of our book, Autodesk Civil 3D 2024, From Start to Finish, A Practical Guide to Civil Infrastructure Design, Modeling, and Analysis. My name is Tony Sabat. You were close, Adam. No worries. Um, I'm here with co-author Steve Waltz. Uh, we're here today to tell you a little bit about the book we just published, as well as talk to you about just the industry in general, how technology can be a game changer for up-and-coming engineers entering the market, or even just civil engineers trying to up their careers where they're at and uh, take their careers to the next level with that technology angle. <clears throat> Uh, so today we'll just be a little quick itinerary of what we'll be touching through. First, beginning with the content of the book and why we orient it as such, and then running through some of the applications of the book, moving on to the next steps of your project's data, how Civil 3D can be foundational for many other use cases with technology. And then we'll wrap with some Q&A if we have any, and uh, if we want to, we might even do a, a raffle potentially at the end. So stay tuned, stick around to the end. Um, Let's get into some of our backgrounds right now. Um, we've got some some of our backgrounds here, more formal. Um, and I've been doing a lot of the talking so far, but I'll kick it off to Steve. But we thought it'd be interesting if we kind of gave our introductions as to how we got into got our hands into Civil 3D and where it took us from there. So go ahead, Steve. Sure. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Steve Walls here, based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I work with uh, HDR Engineering. Um, I've been here for a little, just shy of 19 years now. Um, I started actually as an architectural drafter uh, for my fir the first year, year and a half of my career, and then switched over to civil engineering and environmental engineering design, starting learning like the desktop and then eventually civil 3D um, as a drafter designer and then became a CAD manager shortly thereafter, learning some of those uh, programs. Yeah, and um... Tony Sabat again. I had a little bit of bio from my you know, from me is up there, but for inch for civil 3D, I really got introduced to it by accident. I studied architecture and civil engineering uh, both in college, and how, however complementary they may seem, they're definitely working different sides of the brain. And so I always had a full workload in college. Um, but when you come to the end of your college career, you undoubtedly have to choose a direction and a path. Um, you can't just be an architect and an engineer right out of college. So I I, I leaned more towards the engineering side, the create creativity side of me wasn't as uh, strong <laughs> as the uh, engineering side. Um, so I began my my software background from from my really my architecture degree helped me a lot. We would do a lot of AutoCAD and Revit. Um, but in civil engineering in college, we didn't really have a civil engineering software um, path. So when I started one of my first jobs as a project engineer, we were using AutoCAD um, doing plans and creating designs, but it didn't have the same AutoCAD logo that I had seen it was civil 3d and i was like what is this what are, are we using autocad or, or what um and i began to dig into it get my hands dirty after hours with the software and i was like th we're not even scratching the surface for what this quote-unquote civil 3d program can do and that's when i uh, would just uh, begin diving into you know different books different uh trainings and and uh, youtube video clips you know and began getting into customizations and templates and um I actually began to practice and get kind of trained for the civil 3D certified professional exam. Um, and so that's where I kind of got my kind of career and it just kind of exploded from there with just technology in general. Um, and little did I know that was a, a broader uh, a broader topic that we now all know as uh, as BIM. If, uh, if anybody's not familiar with BIM, uh, it stands for Building Information Modeling. 
and it's not just for uh, for the architects out there. It's a, a popular acronym, um, but the concept is really just utilizing modeling software to digitally represent functions and aspects of a building or an asset, really, right, if we want to broaden the topic. And maybe in the past few years, civil engineers have finally gotten some recognition as being a part of the BIM community or the BIM buzzword. And the idea of civil information modeling is getting more popularity. And mostly, um, we're, we're mostly just elements of a building we're being modeled. Now much attention is becoming kind of focusing around the outside of the building, right? Um, we're finally getting some recognition in the, in the broader AEC industry. Um, so building information modeling or civil information modeling is that process of digitally representing and simulating components of an asset, a building, a roadway, you name it, with its with not only its spatial representation, but also the property layers of it, right? So it's not just a, a layer of four inch concrete that's this thick and this wide. It's also representing data and properties of those components to help build out quantities, schedules, project coordination, uh, so much more, right? So if someone asks you if you've ever heard of BIM or worked with it, you can definitely say yes after reading this book, okay? Let's jump into the next slide. There it goes. So let's get into uh, uh, the book. Uh, we split the book up into four larger parts with corresponding sections in each. The first part we start with is simply getting a feel and understanding of Civil 3D. Where are all the buttons, the main focus areas, interface areas, uh, moving between the workspace and, uh, and back. Um, we also dive into the setup of drawings, going behind the curtain a little bit of how drawings are created from scratch, like what happens when I hit hit create new drawing. Um, the second part then begins to get into the foundational elements of the modeling process, bringing in survey data, creating modeling components that your entire design will be based off of. Um, unlike architects, we work in real world coordinates and there's always earthwork to be done, always existing conditions that you're touching. Um, Part three, then we dive into leveraging design specific tool belts, which what we call, we call these because as you progress through civil 3D, you design and build new components that begin to layer on top of each other and are linked and interact with each other dynamically. So if you modify one element like the surface, all the corresponding um, elements that are attached to it or linked to it will respond. This is a, a great benefit. Um, but also, if not understood properly, it could be a great headache and a great um you know, hindrance to your team. So part three, then we dive into it further with those specific tool belts around proposed grading, corridors, utilities, piping, all of that. And then part four comes into more, more automation with expediting the drawing creation, generating sections for plan production, which is everybody's favorite part of design, right? So why, why our book? We wanted to kind of give a little kind of spiel about our book because we've, we've all had our hands in different, different, uh, civil 3D books or, uh, you know, AutoCAD books. And th there's always just kind of a, a this, they always just seem to be the same. And we wanted to make it different. We wanted to make it relevant. And uh, we, you know, we dived into um, creating this book for using real world project examples, real world workflows for how you as an engineer would use civil 3D on a, in a professional environment, whether that's through drawing setup, uh, data shortcuts for sharing drawings or understanding how drawing templates work for when you start a new drawing. Uh, second, we created this just as you would in a professional setting where you would work amongst a team, right? You would be sharing these drawings. Um, it's not just you isolated working on one drawing uh, and small projects by yourself most of the time, right? We work in, a, in this way because this shows how Civil 3D can scale, help you stay productive and be effective at plan production all the way down the road as drawings and projects change and grow. You know, projects are never, never done the first time, right? There's always changes as you go. Um, and then many projects are too large to fit into one single file. So we created this book to demonstrate how to uh, change and, and modify and work within multiple drawings and how drawings can even be coordinated to be more efficient together. And then third, our book covers Civil 3D as, as titled from start to finish. Uh, from drawing creation and templates to plan setup and then sending to the plotter. So part one, then we dive in, looks at settings and the setup. Uh, again, it's a dynamically linked program, meaning elements that you create like a surface, a roadway, a pipe network, you name it, they all feed off of each other, which is again, is incredible for efficiencies, but also if not understood, it can be very confusing. 
Uh, this part, we talk about what settings to look for, how to get your defaults proper for moving fast through your drawings once they're ready. Um, from there, we talk about sharing data with Civil 3D and setting up those proper connections for new drawings as they come because project work can get very large and we want to ensure that no drawings ever crash amidst a, a deadline or a rush in production time. Part two then, we begin to get our hands dirty with the survey data, bringing it in properly on the right coordinate system. Much of the survey work is typically handled by an external surveying company that you'll work with or from another division of your department. So in this book, we really focused on examining that data, analyzing it for proper setup of designs. And from there, we create surfaces, do a similar analysis, making sure proper triangulation, proper creation for us to begin branching into setting up alignments off of it, analyzing its placement with different profiles that you cut, et cetera. Part three then, like we said, building on top of the previous part, we begin to see the dynamic and link context of Civil 3D with proposed gradings tying into existing surface data, developing roadway designs, and modeling utilities that read off of our roadway design. These elements are linked to actually read off of the proposed surfaces versus our existing surface to adjust as the project evolves. Say if a roadway alignment needs to shift, you know, east or west due to a right-of-way conflict or watershed issues, you name it. We can begin experimenting with those different gradings and daylightings to find acceptable slopes, trying to tie back to the existing surface, um, which should never move, right? This is where we talk about linking drawings comes in handy, where you have a existing drawing file connected to your proposed drawings and proposed gradings, um, where we, we could actually reference it into our, our drawings and measure off of it and not actually affect or change it while working. So maintaining this dynamic link without that risk of hindering or modifying the survey data, which should be kind of the, the holy grail that you never touch of, of data, right? And then part four, we dive into the creating sections automatically uh, for analysis and then ultimately sheet creation. And we do some fun stuff to automate not only linear plan production, but also um, grid setups for plotting drawings. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Steve who will run through an example of, uh, of the book. Sure, thank you. Um, so really wanted to focus this uh, topic on scaling up your project design and data. Um, the first uh, example we're gonna show is kind of sh uh, showing how we could scale it up within a, a design environment. And then we're gonna talk uh, on the next slide and the next demonstration about how we could scale it up to uh, share our information out to additional project stakeholders. Maybe they're not overly familiar with Civil 3D specifically, but just some of our options that we have available to make sure that these other project stakeholders are getting the right information at the right time in the right way. So on the left side over here, and this is all covered in our book within the first few chapters of how we set up our project, and that's critical for, for any project, as you know, is setting it up uh, correctly uh, from the get-go. So on the left side, we have our folder structure, and this uh, is a data set that's available within our book. It's available for download to kind of work through the exercises and, and progress the, the design through our book. What's highlighted in red is essentially our data shortcuts. Tony ha had discussed that a little bit, how we could link individual components, model geometry into other files. So we don't necessarily have to X reference a whole drawing holistically into a file just to gain access to a couple components. We could manage that through data shortcuts. And then highlighted in purple towards the bottom are how we are managing our files, how we're separating our files and classifying them. So model is obviously where are those types of files that are gonna contain all of our model geometry, all our working design models. So surfaces, uh, gravity networks, pressure networks, alignments, corridor models, et cetera. References are essentially where we're going to create those files and data reference individual model components into, and then annotate, tableize, and, and do everything that you need for uh, sheet configuration and setup. Basically, essentially creating your view throughout the entire uh, project design, and then we, we get into our sheet creation process, and those are going to be hosted or, or residing within the sheets folder. So taking a look at, at the video on the right, Tony, if you could hit play. This sure. is a workflow that um, is, is definitely discussed in a lot more detail within our book. 
But essentially, we're just going to start off by creating a new drawing. There's a couple different ways you could create it. Um, I just click the plus sign uh, to create that new file. And then immediately, as soon as you set up your file, you're going to want to set that coordinate system projection. Make sure it's uh, projected into a true coordinate system. So going into your settings, uh, right-clicking on the drawing, going to your drawing settings, you could set the coordinate system. In this case, our data set is actually the project design was in South Carolina. So we're going to set that uh, location within here, set it up to NAD 83, state plane, US survey foot. We'll hit OK. And then as soon as you set that, you gain access to the geolocation tool. Good tip is just to, this is something that I do and swear by, uh, anytime I receive a survey file or any new data that I know should be projected, I'll turn on this, I'll set the projection if it's not already set, and I'll turn on the aerial imagery. It's available through Microsoft Bing, and it's basically just a good self-check just to make sure everything is projected in alignment in its true coordinate projection. Is this still going? Okay. So if we work through this, you see the imagery uh, appearing, and then we'll x-reference our survey file into, into this new drawing, just to give that self-check and, and make sure that before you get uh, started with your design, everything is actually located, geolocated correctly. Set the insertion point to zero, zero, hit OK. And then we'll do a quick zoom extents. Type Z, enter, E enter at the command line, and we get uh, a quick view of our survey file that's being XREF thin. And we can see that based off of the geometry that's shown in the survey file, uh, that the utility line work is falling within the roadway. The parcel data on the west side of that highway is located accurately. So we know we've got that good self check just to make sure before we start our design, we're able to, uh, we're, we're in a good location. Everything's lining up right. So to create the data shortcuts, to set that up, this is the second step that you're gonna to wanna to do. Um, we're gonna go ahead and save the file first. And we're just gonna give this, uh, we're gonna put it in our model folder. We'll call this survey model two, just because this is an, an example. Um, but you can see all the, the files in there that, that we've created throughout the duration of, or the progression of our design within the book. And once you save that, you could then set the working folder and start creating your data shortcuts project to be able to link the individual components from one file to another as needed. So if we select the set working folder, we'll go up one just to create a temporary location for now. Give this a temporary name, call this example data shortcuts. And then we're gonna need to create a new data shortcut project folder. And again, these, these, all these steps are definitely detailed and in, in, in our book um, goes through the process of, of creating these data sets from scratch. They'll give it a temporary name for now. Call this the project number and then data shortcuts. And as you can see, that link shows up now. And then you're gonna wanna associate it with your drawing. This way, the next time you open this file, it's, it remembers that it's associated with this particular data shortcut project and you won't have to reset that moving forward. So if we go back here and set the working folder again to our actual data set, you'll see all the, the components, the surfaces, alignments, pipe networks, et cetera, kind of populate underneath that. We'll go ahead and uh, associate that to the current drawing just to make sure that the next time we open that, it's associated. And then as I expand these, you can see the individual components that are available within our data set that, that we have progressed through uh, up to chapter 14. So quick process of how we can make the, the project design scalable and be able to create, parse things out so additional project team members, whether they're designers or engineers, can get into the program and continue to progress the design. We'll go to the next slide. Okay. Oh. All right. So scaling up your project data. So as mentioned, uh, that was the design side. This is more on the collaboration and communication of your design intent. 
I'm going to go over a few different workflows and examples of, of how we're doing this, or at least I'm doing this at HDR, how we're sharing this information out to project managers, engineers, clients, contractors, uh, using it for public outreach purposes, uh, public meetings and whatnot. So we have InfraWorks, which is an Autodesk product, as well as Navisworks. We use those for a lot of the design collaboration internal to uh, our design teams. And then we have other options for uh, such as Speckle and Power BI, where we're kind of consolidating a lot of the information, but exporting that out to something that's a little more easily digestible for clients and project managers and contractors who aren't as overly familiar with Civil 3D specifically. So if you want to hit play, jump to, I think it's a minute 20. Sure. So right here, what we're looking at is Autodesk InfraWorks. Um, as I mentioned, this is a, a great uh, tool for visual inspection. Uh, you could create that model federated uh, model federation environment directly within this program. So you could pull civil 3D files, uh, models. You could pull Revit models, SketchUp, OpenRose Designer, connect to GIS data, uh, USGS. You could connect to a whole bunch of different types of models and, and bring it all into one uh, federated model environment. And we could actually start doing some, some real visual inspection and an analysis and seeing how it's gonna be integrated with the existing built environment. So we get that holistic visual uh, picture. Switching over to Navisworks, uh, this is a little more uh, of a detailed process. So we're gonna leverage the NWC out command for this directly within Civil 3D to create an NWC file that's being read within Navisworks. And that's going to carry all of the model geometry from our design, along with the metadata associated with that. And they'll be able to be surfaced and analyzed further within Navisworks environment. And we use this a lot for uh, design review purposes. So with the project team, we'll sit down with the project team, sometimes the client, uh, project manager, and we'll just hash out any conflicts that we see. So we'll bring Revit models, Civil 3D models, Open Roads designer models, and so on into this one environment and we're able to uh, generate reports and do some level of uh, issue tracking. Um, so within here, I'm just pulling up that NWC file that we exported from Civil 3D. I'm gonna hide this one, the surface, that was the existing surface, just to make it a little cleaner. But as you select this information, as you select the different modeled components within here, you start to gain access to the properties and the metadata associated with it. So it's another level of uh, data that you're able to analyze that InfoWorks actually just does not provide holistically for, from a model federation standpoint. It, does, it is able to surface a lot of the civil 3D metadata associated with the modeled objects, but not necessarily Revit and SketchUp and some of those other programs. You could bring the files in, but you can't, you can't see everything that's really behind the scenes, I guess. So right here, we're selecting the surface. You get access to uh, some of the 2D areas, the 3D areas, and some of the actual geometry, uh, informa geometric information associated with it. And as we select different objects, we'll select the gravity, uh, gravity pipe, and you see the layer it's on, um, the invert elevations, um, you can see the connectors and, and so on. Same thing with the pressure pipes. You get all this great rich information. So from a design team and collaboration standpoint, it, the, that's the purpose. That's that downstream use. You're, you want to be able to analyze all the metadata and, and the model geometry all in one location. And design teams are typically familiar with this type of environment. So what if you're a project manager or a client or a contractor who doesn't really want to jump into InfraWorks, Navisworks, Civil 3D, Revit, whatever it may be, the design authoring tools or the collaboration tools being provided by Autodesk. You want something a little more what you're accustomed to seeing, maybe it's Excel, maybe it's Power BI, or just a, a basic web viewer. There's a, a, an open source product out there called Speckle. Um, it's, it's great. It has a lot of boxed solution connections uh, for Civil 3D, for SketchUp, ORD, uh, Rhino and, and a bunch of others, along with Power BI, and it's free, which is great. Uh, it, 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 being that it is open source, you are able to take their 
uh, code and be able to customize it to create your own custom solutions. Um, but out of the box functionality is great for, for these types of things, for just sharing basic information out. Um, you could set the coordinate system, you set the selections of what you wanna export, and it's just a simple send button. And it takes that information that you've already selected, it creates a web-based application that you can share out. You can link it, share a link to the clients, the contractors, the project manager, and they could actually just open this up in, in a web viewer and they could analyze it. They could flip, flip it around. They could uh, do 3D rotates or orbits and analyze some of the data as well. So not much training is required for something like this. Power BI, taking it a step further, we could build these web-based applications directly within the Power BI desktop itself uh, and, and share those as a published dashboard uh, out to clients, contractors, and so on, other project stakeholders. And I'm gonna go through that process, show you what that looks like. So we're making the connections. We're gonna add the URL where that web viewer is based out of. So it knows which model it's actually talking to, communicating with, and it could pull that model geometry and the data associated with it directly within Power BI. We're gonna do a quick transform data. We've got some basic information. That data uh, column on the right just says record. Um, we need to expand that out, but we're gonna do that in another query because what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how easy this actually is to kind of build out and, and start isolating information to provide the right information to the right uh, project stakeholder. So if we just want to focus on pipe data, we could do that. We're going to uh, remove the first two columns so there isn't too much information in this one. And then object ID I'm going to keep in there because between the speckle query and the pipe data query, we need a way to manage those connections, something that links the two queries together, right? So we have to have some, some column that has a common uh, value to it. And that's why we keep that object ID so it knows which object it's actually referring to and the data that it's surfacing. So we'll hit okay here, build that out a little bit. You see a, a lot of null values in some of these because they're only associated with the pipes and the structures. So we're just gonna filter this out so we only surface the pipe information. And on the right, you have the applied steps. You, it gives you a, a good quick breakdown of the steps you're actually taking for this. You can remove some of these as needed if you make a mistake. And then the data uh, slope, we're gonna change that to a percentage. Close and apply, and then we can start building our Power BI dashboard. So that's up on the right, we've got the data that we could connect to that we wanna surface. You see the uh, relationship being made and we're gonna import a visual from a file. And again, this is available for download directly from uh, Speckle, the Speckle website, free. We're gonna build in that viewer and just make that connection. So we'll drag and drop some of these over, the object ID, the URL, so it knows which model it's connecting to. And we have that common thread of the object ID being available within the pipe data and the speckle queries. And then we're gonna show you how quickly and easily we can isolate information and filter things. So building another table, we're gonna surface just the, uh, just the pipe data itself. So we'll add some of these, the length, the name, the diameter. I'm gonna keep the network name out for now to show you how easy it is to, to add another level of complexity to the data that's being reported. And we'll add that to this other table so we can filter out only just the pipes within each individual network as well. So now we've got this quick Power BI dashboard that we're able to share out and the end user can isolate different types of information, different types of objects that will surface or report out different types of 
object data associated with them. So we've got the pipes, we have everything selected. If we select just one individual network, you'll see the uh, pipes being reported, the information associated with the pipes also kind of trimming down as well. So that's great. We've got some basic information here and it took, I don't know, eight minutes, 10 minutes to create this. Scaling it up just a little bit more, I've kind of used the same data set, but built it out a little more and actually made some connections using Project Explorer reports as well. So it's not limited, this, this workflow is not limited to just the data that's being explored through the Speckle connector. You could actually connect to Project Explorer data reports as well. And that's what I've done here. I've added some more levels of complexity and you're able to surface a lot more information as well. So we're not limited with just that one box solution. So again, it's really about understanding what that downstream use is, the audience that's gonna be ingesting this information, the purpose of what they need the information for. And here we've got uh, an even more souped up version of that Power BI uh, dashboard, um, really, went to town with the Project Explorer and, and exported all the metadata associated with the alignment surfaces, gravity networks, pressure networks. And again, you're able to surface and analyze a lot of the metadata. And this is gold for contractors to be able to take this information and understand, start putting some, some basic, plugging in some basic formulaic equations uh, into these uh, dashboards to be able to understand what the cost is gonna be from a construction standpoint going into bid, um, it's, it's critical for, for them, this type of tool, this type of technology, and it all really roots from how we are modeling within Civil 3D. And that's what we really wanted to focus on with that book is just making sure that we focused on the modeling because that's what it comes down to. We, we're moving into this environment where there's gonna be model as a legal document, digital delivery, and how can we set that foundation for our users um, who are leveraging these programs to be able to model accurately and have hand something off to the contractor that they can trust, right? So here's the, the rough cost estimation tool that I was mentioning earlier in the lower right. As we make selections, all this information gets filtered out and you could start isolating and analyzing all kinds of data from price per linear foot for pipes to excavation requirements for um, for the structures, to get the structures uh, in, in the ground, to understanding how much dirt is gonna be removed from the site or how much needs to be brought to the site. It's, it's a great tool um, for contractors as well. So with that, I'll pass it back to Tony. Awesome, yeah, thanks Steve. This is a great demonstration. Um, like Steve was saying, we kind of, started started small and foundational with kind of civil 3d as one of these main technologies that kind of kicked us off in our careers and how this has really exploded into what you can do with this data and build on top of it um built, like you said too with power bi infoworks navisworks democratizing the data so much so many different data inputs too um, one thing we did want to touch on too was uh, reality capture too if people are uh, familiar with it at all we wanted to just tease out some more of the technology fund that can be had. Um, when I was starting my career in civil engineering, I'd never heard of the word laser scanning. Um, it was a completely foreign kind of thing I'd heard of. E even InfraWorks, Navisworks, right? We just kind of begin to build these programs up as we say, okay, we figured out civil 3D, now what can you do type of thing, right? And um, nowadays, all of these tools are really becoming, um, I'd say the entry fee for being a six in a successful firm, um, having all of these different pieces, being able to utilize them, um, whenever they're needed for different stakeholder meetings, different um, design kind of disputes, whatever it may be. Um, so laser, so reality capture and laser scanning, they've kind of become synonymous, but reality capture is the broad term of essentially that capturing reality. You can, you might've heard it as remote sensing, um, photogrammetry, laser scanning. There's a bunch of different kind of names and buzzwords that float around the topic. Um, but one of the many ways that reality capture is done is with a laser scanner, which is essentially that rotating laser that uh, measures, rotates, and then spins simultaneously mi millions of times per second, right? And you get those measurements, you get these points. Um, and this used to be a surveyor's nightmare 
with millions of points being having to work with versus maybe hundreds, right? Um, but again, it is becoming the standard working with reality capture data on all of your projects, whether it's inside a building, outside a building, um, industrial facilities, you name it. But the amount of the immense amount of data that it can capture can be translated then into surveys, more accurate surveys, bigger surveys, whether it's um, you know longer corridors, city modeling, you, you name it, right? This image here we have shows just a point cloud, which is that collection of points that have been captured, but it's also been combined with some Navisworks features, some 3D models um, with a, you know some basic 3D models of cranes to demonstrate a schedule and logistics plan to simulate an install. Right. So if, if we uh, if we ever get invited back to this group, we'll we'll, uh, we'll do a separate session on reality capture or some other of these uh, topics. We've got plenty of kind of branches to branch off of from civil 3D and just civil engineering technology in general. So just to zo zoom out again, what we've talked about today, the world of civil engineering is just not strictly limited to calculations and slump tests. Our world is expanding just as far and just as fast as other parts of the AEC industry and technology is only accelerating with what we can do in the civil engineering world. Civil 3D was a, was a gateway technology for Steve and I to branch out and broaden our careers, uh, but it still is foundational to many more opportunities in the civil engineering world. So, just what we've talked about today, we did so. We talked about some aspects of the book, how it's beneficial to those either beginning their careers or looking to broaden or enhance their careers with technology, um, and then how we can begin to use that as a start of a new beginning for for you all, and how this can be another tool on the tool belt for creating a great career in the civil engineering world. Um, from here, I think um, might be good to jump into any of the uh, any questions or discussion points that we may uh, we may have. We'll kick it over to you, Adam. Uh, thanks, Tony. That was a great presentation. Did anyone here have any questions? Um, Courtney? Hey there, this is Courtney Rowe out of Tate Johnson Engineers. I was wondering about, is there any way to get around using Speckle to get to Power BI? So what I noticed about Speckle was it's a web-based application. And so security of proprietary data comes to mind. Is there any way that we can export directly to Power BI that we have access to that's um, more secure? So prior to me finding out about Speckle and doing some testing, I really solely relied on both Forge and Project Explorer. Project Explorer will export all the data that you want at this point, um, even supports uh, property set data now with the newer versions. Um, if you are looking to build that built-in viewer, um, Forge is a good option. There's also a program I've used in the past called VCAD. It's by a, a vendor called VLogic, I think it's called. Uh, but VCAD is a secure, um, option as well if you're looking to get that built-in viewer and don't know Forge per se or APS, Autodesk Platform Services now. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I saw Tom, you had your hand up. Yeah, this is uh, Tom. I had a question similar to the, the Power BI data. Um, talking about, you know, is, it, is that a static view that you're looking at? And what happens, how, how do you process that update? Do you have to re-push a new update to Speckle in order to see the new data? Or is there a yeah, it, it is a, a snapshot in time for sure. Um, you would have to use that connector to just push that data out, send it. And as long as you have the same model um, name that you're pushing it to, it, as once Speckle is updated, the cloud hosted version, you'll see that replicated at, within Power BI. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of using Power BI for a lot of that analysis stuff. I've just myself been getting into Power BI for some other things. And so I'm really seeing the power of it for use in a lot of stuff we could do. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun. It takes a little time to understand, but it's yeah, there, there's a lot of things you could do with it. <laughs> 
uh, did anyone did else? Online? Yeah, is anyone else online want to ask? Uh, Ishka, I see you there. Do you have any questions? Want to give some input? Uh, Jennifer or Alvin? For me, I don't know. It's like, I mean, for me, it's like, uh, it's, it's pretty much what I'm doing at the city with like, uh, it's more like workflow based versus, you know, like uh, the whole idea of uh, just like, you know, learn the software. So pretty much learn the software for what you need versus, you know, learn the whole stuff for what you don't need. So, and of course, me coming from the mastering Silphid series where I had to spend time and write that stuff, rewrite and all stuff. I mean, it's a good, you know, breath of fresh air looking at stuff because this is pretty much what the people need nowadays. You know, we don't need you know, to know the whole stuff, you know, we just need specific just to get the job done. So as long as you get them, you know, the tools and you know like how to get from A to Z, you should be good to go. So but so my take on it. So. Nice. Oh. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Anyone? I think, I think we had something in the chat come up. Oh okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Just Jennifer saying it was a great job and being excited for the book. Um, yeah, Tom, you had another question? Sure, I had another question. Oh, I said questions about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, going back to the NASWORKS model uh, that you were showing us, uh, when I've done uh, coordination with NASWORKS in the past, there's a couple of kind of workflow issues that, that we talked about. And one of them was when you have an existing ground and a finished ground, that existing ground is about the finished ground, you're gonna see it versus the, the FG. So you would have to do like a clipped version of the EG so that it wouldn't kind of override the finished ground. What what kind of workflows or suggestions do you have regarding that type of coordination? Yeah, it's unfortunately that's a limitation that's that Navis work currently has. I, I don't really have a great solution other than the clip surfaces or pasting surfaces within Civil 3D prior to that NWC yeah. out. Say merging um, surfaces, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. And then to piggyback on that, um, the other thing they wanted was a separate surface per like material type. So that they have <laughs> materials. Right. So is that another clip surface based process, manual process? Is that yeah at, at this point unfortunately i would think so yeah for now <laughs> i thought autodesk was working on something with um one of their new programs that they've been toying with the so soil terra or something uh, i can't remember the name of it with uh, representing soil boring data uh, more dynamically um but i think that's still in development it'd be interesting to see uh, okay, Courtney, what's up? When you first exported the model, I noticed a lot of things were tying back to zero. Are you finding it like common? Is that like a common issue with the export because it's exporting lots of design data? Or was that just that particular design that hadn't been fully cleaned up? Yeah, that, that's really what it came down to. As long as everything is projected correctly, uh, from an elevation standpoint, it'll pick that up. It won't redirect or, or reassign the Z values. My and apologies on that poor data no, set. No worries. <laughs> when I saw you went to the speckle and then you went to Power BI, that had been cleaned up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I did clean that up. All Sorry right. about that. <laughs> Good catch. We weren't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question uh, with the Navis Works collaboration piece. Uh, when when you're working with, you know, someone that has a Revit model and then you have your civil 3D stuff and all that, uh, with the Revit model being on its own internal coordinates, how are you working that for bringing everything in a geolocation properly? That's a whole nother webinar, I think. Yeah, shared coordinates. Yeah, shared coordinates. <laughs> you can do you you can kind of backtrack civil 3D to a to an arbitrary coordinate system where you can uh, add shared coordinates to Revit and send it out into the shared location. Yeah. Um, and uh, with the Navis Works collaboration, 
Revit, Revit can get kind of picky when you move it too far from 0, 0, 002 in Navisworks. Um, so it, it it's a depends answer, I think. And my other question was at the beginning of when you started your new drawing from your template and you turned on your coordinate system and you brought in your existing survey. I know sometimes we get surveys that are scaled around zero zero, which for us is like 200 feet off or something. So how do you how do you handle situations like that where you bring it in and you're like, oh wow, when I brought my survey in, it doesn't come in in the right spot. I reach back out to the surveyor and say, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that's contract. Yeah, a lot of that's contractual, right? Specifying right. how you want it captured, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, at least on projects that we work on at HDR, the surveying company we contract out, obviously, and because we don't have an internal survey department, and they really need to take on onus on that, the the ownership, because everything does come back to that. One thing so we talked about aren't projected. What's that? Sorry. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. See. Yeah, I was just going to say, if things aren't projected correctly or accurately, then that needs to be hashed out from the get-go. I was just going to add one thing we mentioned in the book, too, is sometimes you won't get the the nice dynamic civil 3D surface from surveyors. Not you know, Civil engineers adopting civil 3D is one thing. Surveyors adopting civil 3D is another, right? So a lot of times it'll just be the 2D, 2D points, if that, or 2D line work, and you'll have to reinterpolate your surface yourself. Oh yeah, then that just opens up a whole liability thing if you start manipulating that and something looks different in your file versus what the surveyor gave you. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's why we try to make that clear in the book too. Don't touch it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Courtney? So speaking of not being able to touch it, um, at least here locally in Austin, Texas, we're lots of times there's a scale factor applied by a surveyor for their work. I noticed that a lot of these workflows you did requires that to be in grid. So are you scaling that back to a projected grid surface? Um, I don't know how to answer that, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, as long as the projection is set correctly and the insertion scale is set correctly, everything from my standpoint, from a design standpoint, should line up. I mean, what, what units are you guys typically working in? Is it US feet, international feet? It's US survey feet yeah. with the scale factor applied. With zero, zero is the base point. It, with zero, zero as the origin, right? So it seems yeah. that a lot of things like InfraWorks, for example, requires you to go back to a grid coordinate system. It doesn't allow you to do a survey surface or ground coordinate system that has a scale factor. Applied. Well, it, it does. It does. Yeah. You can define a custom coordinate system to offset that scaling. Okay. It is a bit of a pain in the butt. But will Speckle allow that and then Power BI be responsive to those things in order to get the proper links of pipes, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think they would because they're not really tied to the coordinate. They're tied to the actual physical properties of the objects. And the objects at our coordinate system scale, we're not going to see such a difference in length of pipe if we were to do the scale factor and then analyze it. We'll see maybe hundreds if it's long enough. Scale it this. Scale it essentially on the side, do not scale from zero zero. <laughs> right. Um, and the other thing about talking about length of pipes that, oh, well, it's going to be smaller or shorter because they have the joints and the pertinence of the fittings and the keys and the discs, there's already going to be excess pipe because we're required to be sitting in the center. Yeah. So that should take into account that it's not just that. But to come back to the scaling thing you were talking about to get the imagery, if you do want the imagery to, to match up um, in the drawing settings, there's a new zone tab. I believe there's also a transformation mm -hmm. tab. And on the transformation tab, if you know the scale factor and there's there's a combined scale factor and there's a surface adjustment factor, 
that's basically the inverse. Mm -hmm. So if they say, well, the, the, the combined scale factor for this project is 1.0012, which would be common in this area. When you go into the uh, transformation tab and you turn on that transformation, you can set it to a, a, a uniform scale or something, I believe is what it is. Whatever that, so it, it has to do with the, the inverse and the, the one over. So if it's 1.0012, take the 12 and subtract it from one. So like to get the inverse of that, so it'll be 00, or zero point nine 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 eight eight. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so you subtract the 12, but that's the number that you actually want in the transformation tab. But be careful because usually the templates have some X, Y translation also. So you have to zero those out and you have to zero out there's a, a rotation as well. So you also have to zero out the rotation. So if you set everything to zero and you put the right scale factor in and then you turn your geolocation on, that should take that into account. You do have to be careful about US everything and national beats too. Right. We, we need to have a whole nother one to learn where we get down and dirty on this with Ishka and all of us again, because I also have a lot of concerns about keeping that same amount of significant digits because yeah. of the coordinate <laughs> of coordinate creep. Yes, five is the number. And so you go past five, five mm -hmm. is not enough when going back and forth to GIS. I have noticed significant coordinate creep though, even though I've used at least mm -hmm. five digits, I've had to use more in order to not get coordinate creep going back and forth. <laughs> so let's table that discussion <laughs> for another time. I have been <laughs> I need to add that to the notebook then. <laughs> um, so I have one more question. Sure. Um, so I can see going all the way through to the Power BI being really um, complimentary for uh, sharing this information with construction teams. Uh, what is your take on this workflow versus using the ACC? Uh, sharing platform? Um, uh, again, it, it kind of depends on what that downstream use is for, what information they're, they're looking for. If they're looking to just navigate the model, they could certainly use BIM 360 or ACC, and that's provided, obviously, the project resides in there. Um, at my company, we use a combination of a couple different document management systems, so it's not as straightforward. For us, we use ProjectWise, which is a Bentley product. We use um, New Forma um, and BIM 360 or ACC now. So what I, my goal is really just to find a solution that fits the majority. And that's kind of why I went that route. Awesome. So any other questions? We're getting pretty close to the hour. Anything from anyone online? I saw Jason join, maybe he wants a recap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'll check in with the recording, I apologize. All right, well, um, thanks, Tony, Steve. Uh, it was a great presentation. A lot of good questions and discussion at the end there. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for um, having us. Yeah, yeah. we I'd say we've got one more thing. If we want, if we've got a few minutes, we were gonna. Um, my, my screen's still sharing. We were gonna do a, a offer a quick raffle. We've got a few extra books that we've got that we were saying if somebody wants a, a free copy, we could send them to you. Um, but there are some constituents for it. You need to, if you if you're interested, find us on LinkedIn, uh, follow us, and uh, make a post about about maybe this session or something. And um, uh, we will uh, we will pick three three random people that that uh, tag us on the LinkedIn, and we will uh, reach out to you to get get your contact info and send you a free copy of uh, our book. Okay, but all right. that's all we've got. Yeah. Oh, cool. you, our, our, we don't have any fancy Twitter handles or YouTube ha or LinkedIn handles, so just find our names there, and uh, we'll be we'll be uh, reaching out to you guys. We appreciate the time.
Yeah, uh, yeah, we appreciate you coming and talk to us. Uh, we're definitely going to look at your book. I know a few of us already have it. Um, oh, it's great. Yeah. All right.